Does anybody have a, a bumper sticker that talks about their faith? That's kind of a, a, a shorthand way that a lot of people use. I, I'm not sure it's quite as common as it was uh, in the 70s when I was growing up, but you still see a lot of them around. You know, they're, they're, they're nice kind of shorthand. You can get all kinds. You can, they're, they're, there's the classical, like the ictus fish. There's the venerable pun. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. Uh, some of them are straightforward to the point of being humorless. Some of them, this is one of my favorites, are a little more whimsical. Jesus is coming. Look busy. Uh, then there is, of course, the honk if you love Jesus and the many variations of that like this. Honk if you love Jesus. Text while driving if you want to meet him. They can be really fun. They can also be a little troubling. And this one is one that's always kind of troubled me. God said it, I believe it, that finishes it. The, the implication, I think, is that if it's in the Bible, then it must be a verbatim quote from God. And if it's a verbatim quote from God, then we have to follow it, whether it makes sense or not, whether it offends our moral sensibilities or not. Ours is not to question why. Ours is but to obey perfectly, mindlessly, unquestioningly. That doesn't really go over that well in the UCC. We tend to be a little more independent. And this one, I think, uh, maybe sums us up a little better. Um, God said it. I interpret it to the best of my ability, keeping in mind the limitations and filters imparted by my worldview. That doesn't entirely settle it, but it does provide a trustworthy, if incomplete, platform on which I can base my values and decisions. It doesn't really work for a bumper sticker, though. You'd probably end up causing more accidents than you prevented uh, with people trying to read all of that. There's a bit of a problem with bumper sticker theology. One, it's hard to say something really meaningful on uh, a little bitty piece of, of, of adhesive uh, paper. Um, but another is bumper sticker theology can be very narrow and not at all deep. Bumper sticker theology, like the, the last one, makes a lot of assumptions. It kind of assumes that we're living in the same world that the people were in biblical times. And the truth is, even people in the Bible weren't living in the same world as other people who lived in different biblical times. The, the world changes a lot, and assumptions about the world change a lot as culture changes. We don't have the same assumptions about women that ancient people did. We don't have the same assumptions about slavery. We don't have the same assumptions about property because, uh, well, in the Old Testament, uh, you were dealing largely with uh, an agricultural uh, milieu before that, uh, a nomadic worldview. Uh, in Jesus' time, a city-based view, but, but all radically different than what we know today. But I don't think even that's the most important issue. I think the assumptions that this makes about God and about us as God's people really maybe should be questioned. I think that questioning God is a way of opening conversation. And I think God likes conversation. In fact, I think God likes a good argument. That was kind of driven home to me 
a uh, while back, somebody I follow on Twitter, uh, the Rabbi Dana Rutenberg, was talking about something that I had never really thought about. She said she gets tired of hearing politicians talk about our Judeo-Christian tradition. She said that's not what they mean. She said they're really talking about our Christian tradition and they're making an assumption that Jews are basically just Christians without Jesus. She said that's not true and to make her point she said one of the things that somebody said about Judeo-Christian tradition is we all accept God's word unquestioningly and obediently. She said no, no, as Jews we argue We've been doing that for as long as we've been in, in existence. It's part of who we are. We, we argue with each other. We argue with God. And there's good that comes from those arguments. In fact, the name Israel literally means one who struggles with God. If you read through the Old Testament, you can really see what she means. Abraham argues with God. When God appears to Abraham and says, I'm, coming, I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm going to destroy the cities of the plain for their righteousness, for their unrighteousness, their wickedness. Um, Abraham says, really? Well, wait a second, God. And Abraham is very deferential and very respectful, but Abraham argues. Abraham bargains. Dickers. Abraham says, look, what if there are like 50 righteous people in the city? Are you going to wipe them out too? Maybe, maybe you could save the city for the sake of 50 righteous people. And God thinks about it and says, yeah, I, I could do that. And Abraham says, well, if you could do it for 50, how about 40? How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? Abraham gets God all the way down to ten righteous people. Uh, Abraham was a good bargainer. But one of the things that shows up in this story is that God is also a willing partner in that debate. God is willing to give ground. Ultimately, the cities are destroyed because apparently there weren't even ten righteous people. But uh, the point is, there was a conversation, and it wasn't just, I command and you do. It was a conversation with two sides. The book of Job is another example of an argument, a faithful argument with God. Job spends 39 chapters out of a 42-chapter book saying, God, this is wrong, this is unfair, explain yourself to me. And when God finally does at the end... God praises Job for his faith because while, while Job questioned, they were honest questions. Job's friends, on the other hand, tried to gloss everything over and say, hey, no, 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 Job, you don't question. If you're being punished, that's because you deserve it. I mean, effectively, God said it, I believe it, and that finishes it, so don't try to argue your case with us. God says to those people, He's angry with them because they spoke of things of which they do not know. Jonah is another story. Jonah is one of my favorite books of the Old Testament just because Jonah is such an ornery cuss. Jonah is a prophet. Unlike most prophets, he's not sent to the ruling people of Israel or Judah. He's not sent to the temple. He's sent to foreigners. He's sent to the Ninevites, and as Sylvia said, he didn't like the Ninevites. There had been a war, and the Ninevites had been very brutal in the war. The Ninevites worshipped other gods, and basically Jonah thought the world would be better if God just wiped them out. God said, well, no, I've, I've kind of changed my mind about that. And Jonah said, you can't change your mind. You said it, I believe it, and that finishes it. So stop giving me lip, God. But God persisted. Even when Jonah ran away, God persisted. 
Jonah ultimately lost that argument. Jonah found he couldn't get out of doing the job God called him to. But despite that, we see God's mind change in the story. Because in the words, in the, in, the, in the oracles of the prophets of the books of the Bible that had come right before Jonah talking about the Assyrians, Jonah agreed with them. The Assyrians are rotten. Wipe them out. God's wrath is upon them. And when God has decided, nothing will change God's mind. Except God's mind did change. And as so often happens in the scripture, when God's mind changed, it changed towards mercy. There's a, there's a school of thought called process theology. It says that, you know, we, we tend to get this old idea, which I think is partly inherited from Greek philosophy, that we're, we're, we're just like pieces on a chessboard. We don't really have any choice of our own. God pushes us around. We just go where we're moved. And we trust in God who has a mysterious plan. And we don't complain. Because it doesn't do any good to complain or to argue or to try to think of strategies of helping advance God's cause on our own. Process theology says that's not the way it is. There's not this separation between creator and creation. God is intimately involved in creation. God is, is bound up in creation. The two are inextricably linked. And all of creation, and maybe especially human beings, become a part of the ongoing story of creation. That God didn't just stop on day seven and say, okay, that's it, we're done creating, everything's just going to stay static from now on. But that the world, as science tells us, changes, evolves. People change. Ideas change. And that's a good thing. Um, one of my professors in seminary, as he was telling us about process theology, uh, Dr. Al Alan Miller, told a really interesting story. And I don't, I, I'm not going to remember what country it is. I think it's somewhere in South Asia. But he tells a story about a rug maker. He says, the rug makers in this community, they make rugs that coil out from the center. And you've got you've to do this complex weave and what happens is 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 the designer the weaver starts with a pattern the weaver has this beautiful image of what the rug is going to be like when it's complete every so often because it is a long and demanding task the weaver even the best weavers will make a mistake they'll put in the wrong color They'll use the wrong weave in a section. And then there, there, there are two options, really. You can go back and you can undo it and start over. Or you can change the design. You can make a new pattern that incorporates that which started as a mistake. And the, 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 the rug, the finished product, can be grander and more beautiful and more wonderful because of those mistakes. I think that's uh, a good metaphor for God. God has this wonderful vision, this vision that's shared to us through some of the Old Testament prophets, through Jesus, a vision of, of healing and wholeness, of love, of justice, of compassion, a vision of what the world can be like. And we humans, we, we, we often try to work towards that vision, 
Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes they're big mistakes. But faced with the challenge of undoing and starting over, God always finds a way to work our mistakes, our flaws, what we see as our failures, into a new pattern. We are creators with God. It's a partnership. And like any partnership, like any human relationship, sometimes that means honest disagreement. But um, one thing about disagreement, doubt, arguments, I think God always welcomes them if they're honest. Because God is there for us to present anything to, everything, even the dark things, even the things we don't like discussing. So we don't need to be afraid. We can be as completely honest with God as we are with any partner in life who we love and who loves us. Um, I don't know if you can put that on a bumper sticker either. But, uh, but maybe, maybe it is more important to know that it doesn't all fit on the bumper sticker. God is still speaking and we are part of that con conversation. And as we bring to God everything in our lives, the good and the bad, I am confident that we will come through the other side of any argument more loving, more faithful, and stronger than ever. Amen.